Welcome back to Plastic Surgery Untold. I'm Dr. Johnny Franco, also known as Austin Plastic Surgeon. And today's episode is all about body contouring after massive weight loss. So uh, we're going to jump into that with our special guest, Dr. Bahardi, in just a minute, who's coming to us all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina. So appreciate you taking out time to join us today. Uh, but before we jump into to, to him and all his specialties, uh, we got our celebrity crew again. Uh, uh, Producer Donald somehow wiggled his way into to a seat since we're doing our first uh, uh, Tele One in probably a couple months here. Yeah, so, yeah. Donald, what's going on with you? Anything new and exciting? Oh, man, I, you know, I've, I've been busy. Still doing the video game stuff. Uh, went over and spent some time over at uh, Dr. G's office uh, doing some dermatology work. Okay. So, you know. Going through that, feeling okay. the pain. Oh, so you saw you saw Austin's most beautiful man got a little dermatology work, and then went on a big date. So boom, 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 G. Berto's <laughs> making the magic happen. That's that's interesting. I'm Damn, making Austin more beautiful. Just uh, one yeah, patient at no, a time. The, the women there of Austin is. appreciate one it. Man there it is. Uh, uh, G. Berto, what's going on with you? Uh, you know, just uh, getting uh, getting excited for the holidays and uh, getting to uh, spend some time with my family and stuff. So uh, just kind of winding up the Christmas uh, shopping and get, kind of uh, knocking out names off that Christmas uh, gift list. Yeah, we, we got a gift from you last week, so yeah. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So Celebrity, you're, what, what's going on with you? First holiday in the new house. First holiday in the new crib, man. Just getting everything decorated, getting everything looking nice. Uh, my wife is all over it, uh, at your trendy therapist. Follow her for all of your uh, your, your trendy. Yeah, I had to. I only, only plugged her once last time, so... Uh, I, I've got to do better this time. I, I got grief for it last uh, after the last. You guys podcast. got a little, little stocking above the the fireplace, or what's going on? No, no fireplace at the new house except for outdoor fireplace. We got a little outdoor fire pit. Um, you and Winston have to come by and christen the new place. We'll do it. We'll do it for Winston sure. Winston likes to christen places. Oh, oh he I does. heard. Oh, he does. <laughs> I Don't heard. you worry. <laughs> and, and then uh, Doctor Bahardi, tell us a little bit about you, and and I really appreciate you taking the time to to join us ac across the country to to be on our podcast. So I really feel like we're coast to coast now, but um. Tell me a little bit about your practice and, and, and yourself. Yeah, so my name is Gaurav Bahardi. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, I'm in practice with two other guys, Bill Cortesis and Joe Hunstead, so three of us, and we have uh, a practice here and a practice in um, Huntersville, which is about 15 miles outside, and, you know, we're busy. We're uh, operating a lot, taking care of a lot of great patients, and we have a unique setup in that we, um, we all uh, – practice a tremendous amount of body contouring, facial surgery, rhinoplasty, kind of a really diverse practice. And um, it's been an interesting time. You know, I've, I've been busy with that and I got a family, I got four kids at home, all girls. So I got a house full of women and, you know, <laughs> And, and, tell you. and you guys are also, <laughs> but you guys, you're being way, you're being way too modest because you're also associated with the medical school, do a lot of teaching. And then yeah. we actually initially met because we're both on the uh, real self advisory board. So you're on a bunch right. of advisory boards as, as well. Yeah. You know, um, you know, Johnny, you and you and I met at real self and we share a lot of the same kind of concepts of, I think you're like me and you're like my business partner, Bill and, and Joe, where, we're just not satisfied with status quo. We're always trying to learn more. We're always trying to push the limit. We're trying to get better outcomes for our patients and we're trying to reach patients in unique ways. And so um, we definitely, are, I try to practice that every day. And we have a fellowship program at our, our, uh, um, pro, at our practice where we train two other plastic surgeons every year um, before they start a cosmetic practice. And, you know, it's interesting with those kind of tools at my side, I actually get better. So, you know, you think that I'm the one teaching the fellows, but actually they're the ones kind of passively teaching me also because everything I do has to be checked. Why am I doing this? Why do you do this? Why do you select this for this patient? What do you do if this patient has sure. that? And, um, you know, we all do that, but it's great to have that in the practice. So that's something pretty unique that we have here. And, um, you know, life is, life is good. Life is crazy right now. You know, um, we're still very busy. We're being really careful in the office and such. And, um, I'm just trying to trying to be busy at work. When I come home, it's like ten times busier with the kids running around, <laughs> going going buck wild. I don't know if you all have kids, but they, they change the game just a little bit. They do. Well, it's it's interesting because the um, how the world has changed. I mean, if you went back 30 years ago and said, "Hey, you're going to have an aesthetic fellowship to learn how to do tummy tucks, facelift stuff," I, I feel like people would have said that 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 was crazy talk because you got to mm -hmm. you know pay your dues, doing the ER, doing the other stuff, and not saying that 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 you know those of us didn't do ER call and do stuff like that, but it it just shows how I think pace and expectations, and and you mentioned it 
the concern for a patient to have the best possible outcome has that bar keeps getting elevated. And part of that elevation mm-hmm. is making sure that when people come out day one, that they know how to do the, these surgeries at a very, very high level. Because mm-hmm. this fellowship mm-hmm. is after somebody's done five, six, or seven years of plastic surgery residency, correct? Right. Totally, man. And, you know, that's the thing is that I think that, you know, when you finish and you take care of your first patient, you you, you don't want to just get on base. You want to round third and, and oh, score yeah. <laughs> and get home. And and I think that's what that's what these fellowships allow people to do. And, you know, I'm sure you think the same way. The aesthetic space in the United States is just beginning it's in its infancy and what i mean by that is the actual penetration into the public arena of actual people undergoing procedures is is astronomically growing and covid has definitely accelerated that people for the first time i think are absolutely more interested in taking care of themselves in improving their overall well-being investing in themselves so i think this is going to be kind of the thing that is that that perfect kind of storm, perfect synergy to really grow the aesthetic space even further. So there, people are going to be able to start practice now and just do aesthetic practice and not have to do as much ER call, not have to do so, as much reconstruction if they don't want to, because the demand is here. And I don't think it's going to go away. I don't know what your all's opinion is. I do not think that we are going to have, even with economic um, concerns and, and hardships, the desire to like be your personal best that's here to stay. And I think that it's going to get stronger and stronger. And don't you think that, you know, and, and cause there's, this is a two part question, but number one, overall, uh, the idea that people become subspecialized into certain areas of plastic surgery has taken over. So the old di- days of kind of mm-hmm. like doing general plastics, doing everything. And then, you know, kind of doing this and that has, has slowly gone by the wayside. There's some incredible hand surgeons. There's some incredible craniofacials, you know, that they can put a face together and all the broken bones. And, and just now that mm-hmm. has become true for, for aesthetics plastics. And, and I think the, the consumer demand wants somebody who does, you know, 200 BBLs a year that does 200 tummy tucks a year, because mm-hmm. you've got a system, you very meticulous in all these things you do. Your office is very meticulous about about the system of taking care of those patients. Yeah, I think so. And you know, it's a it's a simple concept of, of higher volume. Um, typically, will improve outcomes, shorten operative times, and uh, lead to potentially better outcomes because you know you're doing something in, in over and over and over again. You're working on the the process of how you do that specific thing. And then you're adjusting it, right? I mean, that's the biggest thing is none of us practice uh, stale uh, aesthetic medicine, meaning you, you are using your cases and your outcomes and adjusting what you're doing in the future to continue to get even better outcomes. And that really is optimized when you're doing a lot of something. Uh, it, and it's funny because that I last thing, that. and we'll get into the body contour and stuff, but just because you do a lot of stuff on, on Instagram and social media as, as well, do you mind giving them your, your handle while, while you're on? Sure, sure. It's it's my name. It's Dr. D.R. Gaurav Bahardi, G-A-U-R-A-V, last name B-H-A-R-T-I. That's the handle. But don't you think that social media in of itself has pushed physicians to be better? Because you basically have your work on display for the world, you know? And, and I think that it holds us that there's this black box of plastic surgery has gone away. And, and you know, everything we do is is uh, open now and, and, and for oh. view. Oh, it's, 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 it's insane, but it's so great. You know, it's like we're getting more transparency. And I'm going to tell you what. I mean, I don't know about you, you all and, and your experience with social media, but... I love it so much in the fact that initially I had hesitation having accounts and I didn't have any until I started my practice. But what it has done for me is I'm able to display obviously who I am, what I do, but also it is self-selected when the patients show up and Johnny, I don't know if you feel the same way or guys, if you feel the same way in your practices, when they come, it's like they're, they're almost self-selected and matched for you. Like Mm -hmm. your personalities click uh, and, and they are there to see you. And it's awesome. It's, it's so powerful. And I, I think it's, it's, it's been such a great change. And luckily I know most of us here were pretty, uh, had robust, um, uh, um, profiles on social media. So when COVID hit, it, it didn't change anything rather it accelerated it where so many people really didn't. And they were, they were forced to, 
it's a uh, it, it's really a unique time and I, I i really 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 like it actually i i couldn't agree more because you've already self-selected you know one they see your work they see your personality they they like that and so when they come in it's a good two-way street in terms of that because ultimately we want patients to be happy and if they've liked mm-hmm. the majority of the work that you do the chances that they're going to be happy with their results are are high and so you know and ultimately that's what we want we want people to be happy with 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 what we do for them sure yeah, totally. Also, yeah. some of the expectations that you have for your patients are already set because they've watched so much of your social media. And they're like, I know he's going to want me to do X, Y, and Z before I even go and mm-hmm. see him. And I need to do A, B, and C after I go and see him. So uh, many, uh, many benefits. No, no, I, I agree. And even uh, G. Bertha does a lot of injectables. And I've seen him post a lot of stuff because it's nice for people to be realistic. Like, hey, this person got two syringes of Voluma. This is what a realistic expectation is, sure. you know, with yeah. just uh, a, a couple syringes of, of filler versus, you know, mm-hmm. a facelift or something else. Yeah, that's an interesting conversation to have sometimes with patients is, you know, their expectations of what you can do with, you know, the tools that you have and what mm-hmm. they see on social media. And, and so, yeah, it... it, it it's part of the consult, but it's it's interesting to kind of see their eyes light up and like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that it was going to take that much or you could do uh, this with that, you know? I, I, I like I like the educational standpoint of social media. I mean, when right You've there, taken off your social media a little bit. We've seen celebrity anesthesia. The, oh, social media. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think both of those. <laughs> Dude. I, I, I always say it, nips get the follows. Um, it's getting cold what? outside, though. Yeah, it's funny. Dr. Barhardy didn't recognize you with the shirt on. He's like, oh, that's who that oh, is. That's that makes guy. sense. No, no from a, a, an educational perspective, I think it's great because you can reach people. You can answer some of those questions that before the patient even comes to see you, before they're uh, logging in to, uh, to, to set up an appointment for a pre-op or anything, they already have five or six questions that they would have mm-hmm. For you answered already when they've been watching you for two months or a month on social media every day you're in the or you're you're talking about stuff you're going through educational things about uh different procedures and and what you do in each of those i, I think it, it it takes care of a ton of the back work Let, let's jump into to uh, body contouring because i could derailed us a little bit but but dr Bar- talk to us a little bit you know what's unique about and, and the challenges because patients have typically gone through a lot whether they went through a bariatric surgery or just on their own through a diet exercise have lost you know 100 pounds so, you know how do you what's different about these patients and then someone who you know maybe just had two or three c-sections just coming in for like a mini tummy tuck or something like that uh, how do you approach them differently and and typically it's a process yep you know, this concept of, of, of managing a patient after massive weight loss is is definitely a little bit different than, you know, a traditional mommy makeover uh, or, or someone who's had multiple childbirths but hasn't necessarily had massive, massive weight loss. Mm-hmm. When patients have a large, large volume weight loss or, or cycles of massive weight gain and weight loss, it not only affects the traditional areas like their abdomen or their breasts, but it affects their thighs, it affects their arms, it affects their upper back, their mid back, it affects their face. So mm-hmm. there's this kind of global change that you, you see. And, and the hard thing for these patients, and we've all seen it, is that not only have they you know, lost all this weight, they have changed their lives, they're off of all their medications, they, uh, blood pressure's normal, they're not mm-hmm. diabetic anymore. So like they're a different person, but yeah. They're left with this veil of tremendous amount of excess skin and some extra excess fat. That is like the last step. And it's like, oh my God, they came all this way. We, I came all this way and now I have all of this. So it's a huge deal because this stuff causes functional issues. It causes issues with working out, with fitting in clothing. And more importantly, it's a confidence thing. It mm-hmm. really is a difficult thing to deal with. So it's a little different too, because you know you had hit on two things. One is natural weight loss, and the other is bariatric weight loss, meaning that they've had a surgical procedure that has led to their weight loss, and sometimes that can be a very precipitous, mm-hmm. fast weight loss, and sometimes it can change how they actually metabolize and, and uh, absorb nutrients, so that can affect how they heal. So all those things go into play, um, and that can affect kind of what and how you do, but these patients are some of my favorite i mean my absolute favorite patients because they are so happy with with this process and closing the book and finishing it and also they just it's just miraculous the actual results i mean we've all we've all seen them and every time i don't care how many times i do it it's still so satisfying because it's just 
It's just boom. When you're done with the procedure, when they come in afterwards, they're smiling. They have confidence on their face. They're wearing clothes that they couldn't wear before. They're working out. And so it's it's really, it's incredible. And there are some parallels to the things like to mommy makeovers that you do, but there are some significant differences because typically in these patients, you're taking off a lot more tissue, a lot more actual skin. Um, a lot of times we have to stage the procedures because mm-hmm. there are a lot of places we want to work on. I mean, you know, Johnny, when you when you see these patients, you know, same thing, right? We, we, you can't do it all together, right? I mean, what's what's your operative time limit typically when you're when you're doing a big combination case? Somewhere from that six to seven tends to be the ultimate uh, cutoff, you know. And, and really, if we could stay under five, that that that's ideal. But six seven tends to be my my ultimate. So we do do split stuff up, and then we tend to be really aggressive in terms of. DVT management for some of this. Mm-hmm. We send everybody home with compression devices. Uh, we send start everybody on on Eliquis the day after surgery, um, and so those are some things we've done. But no question, staging and 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 kind of you know. Th- one of the things I tell all of our patients who come in with this this type of massive weight loss stuff, because you hit the, the nail on the head, I think people forget it affects your face, your neck, your arms, your thighs, is that this is a process, you know? And so it's going to take some some time to get there. And I always tell people, you know, one, what bothers you the most? Because there's certain things that we can that go well combining together and certain things that don't um, and, yep. and, and make it a little bit more difficult. But, but we want to incorporate into that you know, what bothers them the most? Because it's one thing for me to say, oh, let's do your tummy, let's do your breast or whatever, and then completely skip, well, my thighs are the thing that bothers me the most, (laughs) you know? And so we want to be sensitive to those needs. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, you hit a great um, concept. We do similar thing from a standpoint of amount of time, six and a half, seven hours max. We keep people overnight. We do people, uh, we we use Zeralto, so we start Mm -hmm. that the next day. Sure. So I think DVT prophylaxis is extremely important. And also we got to remember to walk these patients. They have to be ambulatory. They can't be slugs. The, um, the days of staying in bed for a week are gone. I mean, those, those are gone, gone by the wayside. But you, you hit, you hit a good com- point about, you know, I, and this is all about patient care and understanding what your patients want. And that is we have to listen to our patients, no matter what we're doing, whether it be breast dogs, whether it be tummy tucks, whether it be, liposuction or injectables and make sure we actually understand what they want because what I've learned in my uh, short little career so far (laughs) is that building rapport with your patients and ensuring that you're on the same page the most important thing you can tell them that hey for this massive weight loss patient you need a body lift it's going to be it's going to it's the key it's a cornerstone to all body lift I'm sorry all massive weight loss surgery right Johnny that's what we're taught Mm -hmm. and if they all they gave a damn about was their thighs (laughs) and you ignore that you're going to have an unhappy patient. And, and I think that that used to happen a lot in, in aesthetic surgery, but not anymore. Mm-hmm. The patients are smart. They've done their diligence. We need to listen. We educate them. We can redirect them, say, you know, you really would benefit from the circumferential body lift first because it could have an effect on your thighs. So maybe we don't have to do as significant of a thigh lift on you. But if the thigh lift is what you're most interested in, then, hey, let's focus on those thighs. So I really I really applaud you on that because that's so important. And that has really helped me become a lot more successful. Same thing with injectables. I mean, it's the same thing. If you just tell if a patient comes in and their main concern, just for lack of better terms, is their lips. And you say, you know, your cheeks are really hollow. <laughs> you would really benefit from this. And the truth is they probably do need it there. You know, it, it, there's nothing worse than when someone's unhappy. You get a great result, but they didn't want that result. And so right. I think... It, We've got to do what our patients want. And a lot of times what I'll do is is we'll list out all the things that, that really concern them, you know, like the legitimate major concerns for them. And then we'll talk about what's most important. And then we also I tell them, but there's also a little bit of give and take because some procedures go better together than other mm-hmm. in terms of just kind of mobility, depending on positioning, length of times. You can't have two super long procedures <laughs> done at the same time. And so trying to figure out like what's going to fit in that time period and so mm-hmm. that we can piece it together as well, because you also don't want to sabotage them where you know you're dragging this out over six different surgeries and so if there's a few that we can combine based on time and kind of recovery then, then trying to help guide them in that importance too and i feel like that that's where we you know we can educate them in a best way to get to that end path but but ultimately taking their their uh, their concerns into consideration for sure no i i agree with you and and it's nice to be in a, in a setting, you know, where we are, we're luckily in a setting where we have our fellows who are plastic surgeons who can help, who are assisting me. And we have first assist, which you have also. And 
we can take on these big cases. So we can get a lot done in six and a half hours sure. and we can then do another secondary and then hopefully get a lot of these done in, in just two stages, which is really great. But no one should, no surgeon should ever be concerned about separating and breaking things apart. And I think that's an important concept because if you're a single surgeon doing this thing, you don't have help and you try to do a circumferential body lift and you're doing arms and breasts or something like that, eventually it's just too much. And so segmenting these are, is an, is an important thing. It, it, it ensures better outcomes and minimum and lessens the risk of complications. It was funny. Cause on our, one of our previous episodes, we were talking about the business of plastic surgery and how you set up a good system in, in your office. You know, the people like you that have a efficient OR that does a lot of these with your team, you know, a lot of that helps with that too, because the entire OR mm -hmm. team knows the system, you know, runs really flawlessly. I don't think people realize how, how much time you can cut down that doesn't affect patient care per se, other than shortening mm -hmm. the time by being very efficient. So you're not hurrying, mm -hmm. but you're being efficient in your moves in the operating room. Great, great concept. You know, I, it's funny when patients and you guys probably get this too, is that, you know, when a patient says, are you doing, I had one patient last week ask me, so when you do my case, are you doing any other surgery that day? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing lots of surgery that day. She's <laughs> like, well, 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 are you going to be tired? How are you going to do it? And, and I told her as like, number one, it's an interesting thing when, and I'm sure all of you all feel this way, even when you're tired, when you're in your element, when you're taking care of patients, it's like everything is blinded to you and you're in mm -hmm. the zone. Um, but also then I talked about this concept of efficiency and this concept of, of, of working in a very diligent, quick fashion, but that's very methodical and calculated to where you go fast when you need to, you go slow when you, when you need to go slow. And so that's that ability that, you know, we all have that we know when we can be a little bit more aggressive and move fast or when we're turning over, changing positions, we have the whole team, all hands on deck, boom, mm -hmm. you know, you can do a big position change in a matter of a few minutes where let's say you're doing it at the hospital. I mean. Guys, you know how long it would take at the hospital to do it. <laughs> might as, might as well go get lunch, man. <laughs> right? Hey, I, I, here's a, a question for you is how long after their – so someone who had a bariatric surgery uh, and after they have gotten into a stable weight, how long do you make them wait till they, they have their surgery? You know, I'm, my number is usually six months of, of stable mm -hmm. weight ideally. Um, that, that, that's after, what I do. After something like that. I, I, I tell people you need some time for your body to, to, to kind of mm -hmm. get right. You know, it's when you're losing that weight, your body thinks it's starving. It's just not in a good place. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I, I feel like I get a lot of pushback. So I just want to make sure I wasn't, wasn't alone out there in, in, in making patients wait. Especially when patients are losing, uh, you know, a hundred plus pounds. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's a big weight swing. That's a huge percentage of their total body weight. Um, you need that to level off. I was I was also going to ask I wanted to follow up uh, to Johnny's question like what other other like pre surgery things that uh, should patients consider before going to see you like other than the weight loss or are there any other kind of like special labs or things like that that they need to to have done? You know that that's a that's a good question. I think that you know coming in for the consultation is never a bad thing. A lot of times, these patients who have had bariatric surgery. Are, need to be followed by their uh, bariatric providers and just to make sure that everything is, is, is okay. And the things that we look out for are nutritional deficiencies mm -hmm. potentially, and also anemia. You know, if these, if some patients when they have a uh, specific bypass type of procedures where their, you know, their GI tract has been rerouted, that fundamentally can cause some issues with uh, nutritional status, which means wound healing could be compromised or they could become anemic. And obviously when you do a surgical procedure, if you, you typically lose a little bit of blood. So if they're anemic at baseline, then that could be a problem. So having um, uh, stable labs and, and normal function is important. A lot of times you obviously will get those checked, but you have to be careful for these actual bariatric patients even more so that they are optimized. You know, the one thing about what we do from a plastic surgical standpoint is that you know, all of us here are taking care of people who should be very well. These are all elective procedures. So mm -hmm. the goal is really have these patients as tuned up as possible. And then we're going to take them to the operating room and inflict this big trauma on them. And then they need to heal. So it's it's upon us and, and everyone um, to try to ensure that they're as safe as possible and can endure the procedure that we're going to put them through. What, what would you say is the most common, like maybe top three or four uh, uh, post-bariatric surgeries that, that you do? Um, you mentioned circumferential body lift. Um, yep. what, what, what else are very, very common ones that you do? So I'd say body lift number one, and a lot of them have the Florida Lee component, which 
um, is a, a vertical incision in addition to a horizontal incision. And then, you know, one of the most popular ones now that's gaining a lot more traction is kind of the uh, um, uh, posterior torso lift, i.e. the bra line back lift, because mm -hmm. a lot of times this is really interesting because, and you, you guys all probably know this, but I want to just illustrate it for the, uh, or describe it to the listeners and viewers. When you do a body lift, like for the abdomen, it's always black and white. You know, you got to get rid of all that extra tissue. You can kind of grab it just like that. You know, it's got to go, got to go. Now for the posterior part, meaning above the butt and that lower back, if you grab that tissue and you pull up, it pulls the buttock up, but it doesn't do anything for the upper back rolls. And some mm -hmm. of these patients have a tremendous amount of laxity there. So the bra line back lift, which is a lift in the bra line where you grab all that tissue and lift it up can be very powerful. And so sometimes I'm doing that procedure and a fleur-de-lis abdominoplasty to get together because it's basically taking care of the whole entire torso all around. Sure. And then the, the 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 next most common would probably be um, brachioplasty or thighplasty. They're very mm -hmm. similar procedures, so take, dealing with that extremity. How, what's your order? Is it similar to that? It's similar, and I, I think the the bra line one is a a super. Uh, important concept because, you know, I do a lot of butts in my practice and uh, there's, I get so many patients that come in that want to just liposuction that. And, and it becomes, mm -hmm. you know, our job to, to educate them that that's a skin issue. And, and, and me liposuctioning that is going to have very little effect for them if they just have a huge amount of excess skin, you know, and they're, yeah. they're going to be disappointed. Uh, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting because I, I think I get a little bit of a slanted view just because I do so many butts in my, in my practice is unfortunately, uh, when people lose all this fat, that a lot of times they lose their butt too. Mm -hmm. And so some of these mm -hmm. procedures, like the circumferential body lift and these these uh, uh, any type of these lifts, spiral lifts, some of these other things that, that go more around the, the back, because they lift that skin, unlike a breast lift, they actually tend to flatten the butt a little 100%. bit. 100%. And don't give you that kind of bulge lift, like, you know, we cone the breast. It doesn't cone the butt. And I, I think that's a misconception. And sometimes trying to educate patients about the options there in terms of what effect it's going to have on their butt. And I'm not saying they're bad procedures, but don't want to mislead yep. people that this is going to give them a plump butt. <laughs> it may get rid of some of the skin, but but it's not going to round that butt out. Sure. Johnny, you're, you're, you're so accurate. And one of the things that I started to do on all the, the um, buttock lifts that I'm doing the, the, or the posterior component of a body lift is, is suctioning the absolute daylights of the resection pattern, suctioning out the hip rolls and just doing an autologous fat transfer right then. Yeah. So everything that is removed to put that in there and it's made it better and it's, it's lessened the flattening appearance. And I always counsel them all that you will have buttock flattening and if you don't do any simultaneous fat grafting it's going to be it's going to be significantly flattened so i i really ag agree with you on that and i try to fat graft every single one of those patients even the massive weight loss who you think there's no fat there's always fat there's always fat in the resection pattern so suction it out and what i do after i suction it out i do an avulsion technique so after mm. it's suctioned out just tear it off there's no bleeding. There's no seroma. I do that for the arms too. And it's a, uh, it's a good tool in case you haven't tried it. I, I, I love that for the arms and thighs. I, I absolutely love mm -hmm. it. I, I just recently started doing my thighs that way. And, uh, I wish I could go back in time. I, I feel like, uh, tend to get better results. It's easier for me. Uh, and it's funny because this goes to your point about being efficient, right? You know, patients are getting better results and it's easier for us. So and the other thing is, you know, is the dreaded uh, lymphocele, you know, mm -hmm. vertical thigh lift. Guys, if you get a lymphocele in the vertical thigh lift, it's such a nuisance. And like these patients have to have these things drained yeah. for like weeks mm -hmm. and months. And I haven't had that happen. So it definitely makes it, makes it better. I knocked on the hard thing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Listen, it, you know, the, the bet, you know what I always tell my patients, I say, what, what's the likelihood of it getting a complication? I tell them it's, it's super small or if it's one in a thousand or whatever. And, and, you know, I'll tell them, but I've had it because I do enough to get it. And, I, and the thing is, it's almost like you want to get a complicate that complication as a surgeon because it, it always it keeps you on your toes. Like I mean, everybody here knows, you know, you know, if you're if you're operating, you're doing injections, you're taking care of patients, you are gonna get a complication. You're gonna get issues. The key is how we manage those. And I I I I I'm that's why it's it's almost a gift to be in practice a little bit longer, to take care of patients, to see more so that you can just, you know, you're going to handle it. And all of us here on this call in this video really care about our patients and are going to be there for them and, and take care of them. So I think complications are a thing that I, I, I'd love to talk about a little bit about 
with any surgery, but with, with massive weight loss body contouring, where you have literally just hundreds of, of centimeters of inches of, of incision line, you're going to get some degree of complications. Usually it's typically just some wound healing complications, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and your approach to potential complications in these patients. I hundred percent. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and some of this is the reason that people do a fellowship with you, because the hope is that you're going to learn how to manage some of these complications, how you prevent some of these as many right. as you can. It sounds like you and I are both super aggressive, uh, trying to prevent the most dreaded complications, i.e. DVT, DVT. Uh, you know, PEs, those things. Uh, I know that we've talked in the past. Uh, I don't want to get a sidetracked again, but there's even special things we do for the fat transfer in terms of avoiding muscles, stuff like that to prevent mm -hmm. fat emboli, you know, and so there's there's a lot of things we do to prevent it but even then some of the small stuff like the skin issues especially if you're doing a circumferential body lift there's just no way you're not going to get some little small delayed wound healing areas and and mm -hmm. and sometimes i don't even like to call those complications because i tell people you're going to get it somewhere i can't tell right. you where but you're going to get somewhere if somebody has a breast that's their nipples all the way down to their belly button and we're getting them up and high and tight and right uh, you're going to get some little t little little wound healing issue we just can't move your nipple and make your breast that high and tight without some little stuff and so i think this is some of the part of us managing expectations like hey you're gonna get some little stuff bumps are along the road inner thighs is one i think right in the groin crease that that's hard to not get a little something you know mm -hmm. but we're gonna take care of you throughout the process yep. and you know the great thing is is i always tell these patients because like you said you made your list of everything that's important what they want to tackle initially is that most likely you're going to have a second stage and at that point I always, you know, offer them any area that I kind of know I can improve. But, you know, let's 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 a, a touch up that area, and it's an opportunity just to really supercharge your result. Sure. And so that's that's another great thing to always let our patients know that you know we want a better result than they do, and so we're going to do whatever we can to get them there. But sometimes we need to do a little tweak at at some point. And, and, and I think this also comes to why there's a limit, you know, uh, there's always the question of like tummy tucks, lipo, body lift stuff, and and you know it's funny because. You know, you, you're very strategic and smart about how you're lipoing. You know, you're lipoing the areas that you're going to resect. And, and, you know, you can lipo other areas. But there's so many things that go through our mind in terms of, like, being smart about how we're attacking this, what areas we're doing because of trying to protect that blood supply and, and different, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. different stuff for this. 100%. I, I think that's the thing is, right, we have to be uh, very thoughtful in what, in what we do. And at the same time, we don't want to be wasteful when we it, now it now it's like every time you lipo want not waste not you know <laughs> you can't you can't throw it away it's that it's that liquid gold i, I know you believe it yeah <laughs> i mean this guy this so, guy love loves some fat we're bringing fat back i i got a question for you so we we kind of went into this and we started talking about the different procedures different uh um uh pre surgery things and stuff like that like who's a good candidate for this right so like personally myself i've lost over 130 pounds and wow. like is that enough for like one of these big massive surgeries or like do i have to be like in the 200 pound loss range or who's who's a good candidate uh, uh, g go, go ahead i mean i i think yeah. everybody everybody's different like people yeah. some people have loose skin after 20 pounds some sure. people uh, you know, have great skin after even 50 pounds of weight loss. It's very individual and what body parts it affects is, is a little interesting. I have some people that lose all this weight and they lose it all in their face and they need a neck lift, but their tummy actually still looks great and, and vice versa. I mean, it's, it's hard to predict. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is the great thing about this field is that everybody's so different and, and the manifestation of massive weight loss on, on two people can be totally different. And most of the time it's going to be driven by the patients. And I think that, you know, 130 pounds versus like, uh, John was saying, you know, 20 pounds, it is, it is very variable how that's going to present and how it's going to affect the individual. But no, I mean, congratulations. That's a massive amount of weight. That's a whole it person is. of weight that you lost. You it's know, a whole Johnny. It, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Maybe. And, <laughs> But you know, you but you 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 look great. Your face looks great. So no, we can't tell. So you know, you're you're one of those people who has done it very gracefully. Um, Boom. And and figuring out who who's a great candidate just depends. And I think that that's why we're at a very unique position that anybody anybody can potentially be a candidate for certain things and 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 addressing it. The key is 
the operative plan is going to be very customized to each patient. I, I, Dr. Bahari, I don't know if you guys do some of this in, in your practice. You guys do so much body contouring. One of the things that's been interesting that we've incorporated in our practice, because it was a huge kind of like area, and I don't want concerns, not the right word, but but a place where patients left lacking and I felt lacking too. In, in some of these patients who've lost 130 pounds and we've done a tummy tuck, you know, overall that's, their body looks great. When they stand up, you know, it looks really good, but they just had this loose texture to their skin that, that drove them crazy. And, and a lot of those patients now we've started going back and staging them and coming back and doing like a, a J plasma Renuvion. I know some people do body tight. Do, do you guys do anything like that with any of the the massive weight loss uh patients because there's a difference between taking out skin at some point there's no more skin to take out but trying to change that that skin mm -hmm. turgor you know that tightness of the skin which uh, you know we try to be very upfront if you got stretch marks going all the way up there's a limit to how tight we're going to make that especially when they sit down or those type of positions yeah you know you, you're totally right it's that that skin inherently is for lack of a better term, damaged or, or it just mm -hmm. behaves very differently, right? And and so it's what we're, what you want to do is you want to try to really pep up um, that collagen synthesis or reorganization and pep up the production of elastin and hyaluronic acid. And so we do things very similar in adding energy, uh, RF type energy, using things like you mentioned, um, Renuvion or using things like uh, body type are things that we have done in our practice. And have continue and continue to do. In addition to that, adding some uh, transcutaneous um, or like RF microneedling oh, cool. as well. So you you know there's some the concepts are and we do a lot of Vaser too in our mm -hmm. practice. And and again, that's a different device. But one of the ideas that we talk about when you're addressing skin is you know you have skin that's here. You can address the undersurface of the skin with you know uh, you know probes like uh, Body Tight or Renuvion. And then you can do transcutaneous, which are needles delivering energy into the skin, into the dermis. And then what we've done on some patients is then doing super low, low dose um, uh, laser therapy, like using like something like a, a halo oh. um, laser or even like a, a very, very low setting CO2 laser. And the idea is to do this multi-laminar treatment of, of the skin and basically just took what we were doing in the face and like, why aren't we applying this to the body? And um, this is I why I love talking to you. I, like I, I learn something every day. The, the, these are dropping nuggets. <laughs> but it's but it's true. And it's funny. Like, think about all of us, you know, um, and what we do for patients on their face and how much money people spend on their face um, for for to keep yourself looking youthful. And we don't we don't really advocate that enough for the, the body. And we should. We're doing a better job. Like one thing that we started using for all of our patients are some of these body firming agents. I like renew. I'm sorry um revision body firm mm -hmm. initially i used to use the nectar firm for you know and anything that i recommend i try to use mm -hmm. and the body firm is another agent so we're putting all of our body contouring patients post-op on body firm also and listen it's not going to be like earth shattering change but the fact is they're going to actually be taking care of that skin they're going to be using an agent that will help that skin at some level than it was before and and i think it's an important thing to just to try to remember to do uh, it, it's it's funny how many of these other factors go into it. And then again, when they see somebody like yourself, like you're not telling them they have to do these, but like, hey, let, let me give you the full track of what it takes to get where you want to be. And and they may not do all the things at once, but at least like, hey, here's here's the simple stuff you can do. Here's, you know, a body firm that costs 50 bucks or something. You know, here's some other treatments you can do down the road, but at least that way they can plan and they have realistic expectations of what mm -hmm. you can and mm -hmm. can't do in each each procedure. Yeah. And you know what else is it's really important is that I tell patients and you all probably say the same thing. I'm curious what everybody says here. You know, when you when you provide a treatment or a surgical intervention, it's not you don't just get it and you walk away. You you, you are becoming a part of that practice. Like in our practice, we say mm -hmm. you're becoming a part of our family and that we're going to take care of you before your procedure, after your procedure. And then we, we need to we need to address all of your aesthetic needs. We need to address your facial aesthetic needs. We need to address your body aesthetic needs. And we want to maintain everything we've done because you're going to, you're going to invest all this effort, all this um, um, capital into whatever change you're trying to gain. And then we need to hone it in and protect it and address all the other things that you have. And I think you probably do a great job of this, but we really try to focus on this because that's the way I think you can really ultimately get the best outcomes, the happiest patients. And you also get, stability for your business also.
And and it's funny because sometimes patients forget there's some simple things they can do, like like a good sunscreen, yeah. a good moisturizer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be crazy expensive stuff to, to really <laughs> take care of themselves. And, and G. Berto probably knows a lot more about that stuff than I do. But, <laughs> you know, there's some simple things you can do, especially if you start when you're younger, that's going to pay dividends over the long term. Yeah, and I, you know, and that's that's really important, interesting. And I actually, I knew you were about to chat, and I was going to ask you. I'd love to hear how you handle that with your patients. How do you handle a patient who's going to come in, let's say, for example, who's just comes in for a filler or a, or a neurotoxin consult, but really kind of opening their eyes to what they actually need to be doing, you know, so that they have this, you know, lifetime result. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of it goes into establishing that rapport with the patient and and kind of telling them. Hey, I know you're here for for this particular procedure that brought you in initially, but let's talk about all these other things that are going to be really important. And not only, you know, maintaining what you what you're going to get from this procedure you're coming in for, but also is going to benefit you in the long run, and and it's going to pay dividends, you know, in terms of skincare, uh, you know, um, skin uh, improvement of the, you know, um, skin laxity, uh, you know, all these different things that come with with, uh, you know, a good foundation of, of, you know, skincare, which, which I usually tell my patients, you know, a good foundation for skincare is like, like Dr. Franco mentioned is it's going to be a, a good sunscreen, a good moisturizer, a gentle cleanser. I try to put all my patients on a topical retinoid, um, or retinol, depending on what they can tolerate. And then all the other things that come with that, like, like the Nectifirm, like the body firm, uh, like a vitamin C serum, those are just kind of like the cherries on top of the sundae. Uh, and, you know, overall, we want to try and help them, uh, uh, I guess, address things that maybe they didn't even know needed to be addressed like, from a holistic standpoint, you know, just kind of looking at the, at the patient as, as a whole and trying to, you know, take care of all their needs, not just what they wanted to come in for that particular day. Uh, Dr. Bahar, Man, just I, I love that. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but okay. the reason why I love it is that I'm glad that you're seeing this and you use the word holistic. Like, listen, what's interesting about what we do as aesthetic providers is we actually care for the patient from almost from top to bottom. And like, that's the things we got to realize is that there's more to it. We are really trying to take care of that patient, you know, in every way, obviously there, there are some things that are out of our um, <laughs> uh, ability to address for them, but we're not just trying to, trying to get them to have surgery. We're not just trying to get them to get, you know, five vials of this. It's, right. it's, it's about, we want to get them to a place that they are just, they are at, at, at a level and an overall sense of well-being that they are just happy to be at. And I think if they feel care cared for in that way, they're going to keep coming back to you because they know that you are taking care of them and you're looking out for them in, in the long run. Not, not, not just someone who wants to come in and just get a couple units of Botox during their lunch hour. Someone who yeah. actually cares about, you know, what, what your end results are and, and, you know, trying to get you to that point where, you know, you feel comfortable in the skin that you're in, you know? And, and, that, and that's why people like yourself break up surgeries. If, if all you cared about was the check, you'd be like, fine, let's do everything in so one 20, day because I don't want you to, hours, you're yeah. not worried about them coming back because you know they're going to have a good experience. You know that you're going to do the best job possible. They're going to come back because they're going to be like, I'm so happy with this first procedure. I can't wait till I can do the second one. You know, if you didn't care, you wouldn't say, hey, you got to wait six months till your body's right before we do this surgery. I mean, those are the type of things of when you're finding a physician, you want somebody that's, that cares more about your overall success and health than, than you just trying to book a surgery with them. Listen, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but I have, and it happens more often than not. Well, not more often, but it does happen. Meaning that I see a patient, I tell them, actually, I don't think I would do this. I would do this. And it may not necessarily jive with them, or there's some sort of thing where they don't re they don't think it's a good idea, and I'll voice it, and they'll go somewhere else, they'll undergo that procedure, and come back. I should listen to you, Dr. Mm. Bahardi. I need you to fix this. And yeah. and you know, it's what's hard at that point is we never like as surgeons we don't we don't want that. We don't want to be like I told you so. We never we never ever would wish that on anyone. But you feel bad in a way because they had that procedure, they invested in it. Now mm -hmm. they got to come to you and invest back into you, and they have to have this double procedure. Now yeah. afterwards, when you get them to where they need to be, it's great. But it is it's it's it is really incumbent on us to to protect those patients, try to let them know, and really, really, really do their diligence because sometimes if they do make not the right decision, then unfortunately they might have to have a secondary procedure to fix what happened at the the first time. And sometimes it's hard to fix. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I know I know that Johnny's about to uh, 
about to like wrap things up and I, I really wanted to touch on recovery because on some of yeah. these these procedures like you're talking about the circumferential uh, body lift and things like that like just how long is the recovery for some of these procedures i'm imagining they're like pretty yeah. long yeah so it's a good point and it's very important you know from the get-go that first consultation to really lay out there and i'm i'm pretty aggressive about telling them how things are. i always tell them you know day one in recovery you're gonna feel pretty good a lot of the numbing solutions will be on day number two is when you come in <laughs> and you hate me you don't like anything and from then on you're at this peak of how horrible it could be and then you do this undulating <laughs> sinusoidal pattern of up and down so true and, you, and then you improve and then you go up and then you go down and then patients have pretty significant blue days sometimes too and, and they need to know their families need to know yep. but it's a I, i'm pretty aggressive about getting people up and moving <laughs> and i don't know how you guys feel about it but i say after about four weeks and if they're stable, then I want them to actually start uh, working out light and going to the gym. So four weeks is my number. But for that first little bit, it's hard. And they're walking around in a bent over position. Typically, they have a lot of compression garments. They have to potentially manage drains. They have lots of incisions that have to have tape dressing changes and a lots of follow up visits mm -hmm. um, to assess them. But it's it's a it's a definitely an intense First four weeks is what I tell patients. I don't know. How, what about you, Johnny? Yeah, I, I typically tell people three to three to four weeks. And what's been interesting, and, and I know I'm supposed to be wrapping stuff up, but um, <laughs> I feel like this is why stuff has changed a little bit during the COVID time because a lot of people working for home, I feel like they've been able to shorten that time off work a little bit because if you're on your recliner, mm -hmm. on the computer, those type of things, they have a little bit more flexibility than when they needed to drive, go and sit in an office for eight to 10 hours. Because if they're at home, if they needed a little 15, 30 minute break, they're going to be fine. They're not having the drive. They're not having to do some of those things that, that kind of kept us from letting them go back to, to, to work and that they could be in that good position that we want them to be in. So it, it's uh, in my practice, I've seen people be a little bit more accepting of that time over the last six months than I did previously. Yeah. I, same thing. And one thing that we forgot to mention too, was, uh, you know, when we're doing any kind of muscle work and uh, he's using Expirel, Expirel has really, really helped recovery Stay and remove that agonizing right. pain. <laughs> I, I love it's it. A... Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we use it a lot and down have... here. Yeah, are you, are you guys using it at all in the soft tissue and not only in the plication? Mostly in the plication. I, I haven't used much of it in terms of uh, for the, the soft tissue. Some of the things that Celebrity and I have been looking at is is doing some uh, 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 muscle or doing some, some nerve blocks yeah. with the ultrasound uh, ahead of time. And so uh, something Celebrity and I have been exploring a little bit, doing some TDAPs, other stuff. Uh, uh, celebrity. I like that. That's, that's yeah, good stuff. Yeah, talking about some uh, tap blocks and, uh, yes, erector spinae blocks as well uh, to hit some of those areas. Uh, I think the rectus sheath block when you're uh, – on either side of the plication is great too. Um, you know, it, you you touched on a, a bunch of things. Uh, me and Johnny are huge advocates of getting these patients up out of bed night one. Like they need to be going to the bathroom. They need to be moving around. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've we've jumped on the ERAS protocol train. We we mm -hmm. do a lot of our cases with minimal to no narcotics um, using other opioid adjuncts. So these patients are not. Um, you know, gorked out of their mind for the next two weeks. They're, they feel good. They feel lucid. They feel clear headed. They're not having the constipation and the, the things that come with the sequelae that come with the opioids. Um, when they need them, we give them, but, uh, but we really try to reduce that as much as possible. I, I think this has been absolutely fabulous and, and probably on me for trying to, to do body contouring in one, one podcast. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot here and say, ask you if you'll come back. Cause I feel like we didn't talk enough about arms, thighs, and we didn't even talk I'd about fa to. face and neck, which is another huge part of, uh, after a massive weight loss. So, uh, maybe if we can lock you down here in the spring and steal you for another episode, That'd we would awesome. absolutely love it. Let's do it, gentlemen. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, you're everything. not off the hook yet. Fun. Yeah, You're not off the hook oh. yet. I'm just putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, gotcha, gotcha, so, gotcha. so we do a little section called Behind the Bovi. Uh, what would you tell patients if there was one kind of like nugget that people don't realize or don't see, if there was something you could tell them, kind of a behind the scenes, something that you think is important for them to know? What what, what would you say? Is there, is there anything that, that you would want people to know? Yeah, you know, one thing I would say is – I don't know if they realize how much we care and how, how <laughs> important it is to get yeah. 
the best results and how we agonize. We <laughs> agonize over Agreed. everything. Everything. When, 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 when the blood pressure is low, when the heart rate is high, when there's a little bleeder or, I mean, it's just, we agonize over every freaking thing. And everybody in that OR, I know you guys are the same. The team is so behind getting the best result. And, um, it's just, it's, it's this thing. It's a, it's a unique thing that, and it's every case. And I don't know if that'll ever go away. I hope it does. And if it does, I'm not going to work anymore. I, I agree. Um, the, the day, the day it stops is the day that just hang up that coat, you know, and then it's, it's just time to time to move on. <laughs> That's such a good one. Cause I, I couldn't agree more. Such like a good that. one. Um, what about a little quote of the day? Can, can we get a quote of the day? I go know. Yeah. Yeah. I got one uh, okay. that I think, I think applies, um, uh, to, to today's episode. Uh, so this one's from Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, it says, uh, if I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. And I think that that's kind of a, a, a nice little uh, piggyback on how we were talking about staging, you know, some of these procedures. You know, you may not be able to do everything all at once and, and have, you know, just, you know, knock it out of the park home run one time. But, you know, doing, you know, these procedures in serial uh, you end up with the result that you're you're really wanting. I know that I sometimes take that approach with with my injectable patients, where you know they may want all these things, but either due to finances or uh, time off or whatever, we have to kind of do things you know in stages. So I, I kind of like that that quote for this uh, episode. I love it. I love I love that quote, and I just want to follow you on on what you said about injectables. In addition to that. You know, a lot of industry has really propagated getting people to correction in single settings. And a lot of times that's a lot of a lot of syringes. Yes, sir. When in <laughs> truth, a gradual, a gradual transition, having people come in. I have some patients come in weekly and then you kind of just work them or even every two weeks and you get more precision. And so Absolutely. like you're saying, I think you do get great things by doing them in smaller segments at times. Absolutely. Very yes, nice. Sir. I really love that quote, by the way. Thank that's you. Great. Thank you. Dr. Bahardi, before we sign off here, can can you tell people one more time your, your website and the name of your practice if, if they want to uh, check out your information a little bit more or or message your office for, with more questions? Absolutely. So um, the name of my web, our website is HKB Plastics. Oh, I messed up my own website. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you see, when you're when you're world famous, you don't even need to know your own website. People just find oh, you. So That's fun. what I'm talking it's about. A, it's a, it's HKBSurgery.com. And um, my Instagram handle, again, is Dr. D-R-G-A-U-R-A-V-B-H-A-R-T-I. And um, this has been a lot of fun. This is a, this is a good crew right here. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Great, I, I appreciate right having you. This was fabulous. And so, uh, sincerely, we're, we're, we're going to rope you into coming back again. We've got so many more topics to, to cover here. And so, uh, thank you for taking time out of, out of your day in this, this busy holiday season. And I know you're working like a like a machine every day. So, so thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all of our listeners for, for listening to the greatest podcast in the world. as voted by us. Uh, download us on iTunes, Pandora, <laughs> Spotify, iHeart, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We'll see you guys. Bye. See All right, guys. guys. I will see you in Austin hopefully soon. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. There we go.